Hi, and welcome to another edition of ProBlind. Um, this is the show where we try and give you an opportunity to get to know candidates for public office better. We uh, are very grateful for the 15 years of support by the uh, thrift shop of Aspen. But as you well know, the thrift shop is closed this year due to the pandemic. So we're hoping that you enjoy this program and value it and might make a donation to grassrootstv.org to help offset the costs and fund this programming on your behalf. Today, we're going to get to know Chris Council better. Chris is running for county commissioner in District 4 and is from Snowmass Village and has taken time out of his busy day to come and talk with us today. Hi, Chris. Hi. Good How morning. are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you. So let's try and get to know you a little bit. I, we don't know each other at all. So sure. tell me a little bit about, uh, well, let's start with how did you find your way to Snowmass Village? Um, so before I found my way to Snowmass, I found my way to Aspen. Um, so um, I, uh, I made a career change about uh, 10 years ago. And uh, I was lucky enough to, there was a photography job opening up. Um, so I, I have a background in finance and accounting. And um, uh, so I was actually leading a nonprofit. Um, the, I helped start the Restore Division in Baltimore. And um, sort of got to the point where I was getting tired of sitting at a desk all day and just wanted to be out and engaged a little bit more. Um, so I decided to make a transition to photography. And some of the best advice I got uh, from one of my mentors was to go out and get a job in a newspaper uh, because his advice was you'll meet tons of people but more importantly you'll learn how to photograph everything. So I started applying around the country. I've always loved Colorado. I lived out here about 20 years ago for a stint um, and uh, it's always just sort of been a part of me uh, even though I grew up on the East Coast. So. Uh, I applied for jobs all over the country. A job at the Aspen Daily News had opened up. Um, and I pretty much just browbeat them, I think, until they got tired of <laughs> hearing from me and they just said, fine, take the job and just leave us alone. He's staying here anyway. We might as well <laughs> yeah, hire him. Yeah, right. So, um, so that's what brought me out here initially. So I, I came out as a chief photographer for the Daily and, um, and worked for the Daily for several years. Um, lived over the old Gap building, right over the paper. Um, that was my first living quarters. I, my apartment was about the size of the set here, and um, and then um, yeah, and then kind of the rest is history. So um, I was lucky enough after that to I started my own company with my partner, uh, my own photography company, and um, was able to win a place at Burlingame Phase Two. So I lived there, and and then eventually graduated to free market housing, and that's um, now in Stone Mass Village. How long have you been there? About um, you know, it's a great question, and I. I'm having trouble with him. <laughs> I think it's about, it should be uh, coming up in four years. Okay. Yeah, in the village, so. And you're still doing photography? I am, well, I uh, very actively through February and then obviously the pandemic has changed the world and um, I, I, there's some work I do locally. Um, there's some smaller clients that I, I work around town. You know, our, our magazines unfortunately have been hit hard. Um, historically for the past seven years, We've been the, um, the main photographers for the Aspen Ideas Festival for the Atlantic Magazine for their partner. So um, that's been one of our big jobs in town. And um, we've also done work for Food and Wine. Again, unfortunately, this year those didn't happen, but um, maybe next year they'll come back. Right. Yeah. I think that's pretty impressive to, over the course of a scant 10 years, if you will, to build up to, a, in a very competitive market, um, build up a business that has clients I recognize. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think that's very cool. Thank you. Yeah. But it came back, it, it, before that it was finance and accounting and the ReStore, like Habitat? Like hab Yeah, so like if you want to go way back, um, like I said, I kind of have an interesting background, so um, I there's not many photographers, and I know, I don't think any of our other um, the political candidates have um, a CPA, so I actually have a, a cert I'm actually a certified public accountant. Um, I've kept that active, um, so I'm certified in Colorado as well. Uh, so I started out with Price Waterhouse, and then kind of made a couple transitions. Um, after September 11th, like a lot of people, I was you know sort of looking for some a larger purpose. So I took a year uh, and spent a year with AmeriCorps, 
um, uh, with a nonprofit out in San Francisco. So I helped them start up a, uh, a business, uh, not a business, a nonprofit consulting service for nonprofits around the country with MBAs. And then after I left that, um, I had an opportunity to lead an organization in Baltimore that was focused on at-risk youth. Uh, so we provided housing and had a business aspect. Um, and then uh, I had a sidetrack to, uh, to Russia for a few years. Uh, so I lived in Moscow and then um, came back and started the ReStore in Baltimore. And uh, now I'm here. So a few different chapters in my life, but they've all been a lot of fun. And, and, they've all, and each one is sort of built on itself. So, um, you know, it's kind of given me the experience um, to, to take me to the next, the next chapter. What was the sidetrack to Moscow? Um, my my ex-wife was a uh, journalist. Uh, for, she was a foreign correspondent for the Baltimore Sun. So we had an opportunity to, to live there for three years. So is Baltimore where you're from? I, I grew up in Annapolis okay. um, and then sort of bounced in and out of Baltimore for a while. Right. Say water. Water. Not water? Not water. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't say Baltimore. So. <laughs> right. I have family in and around Baltimore. Okay, yeah. Yeah, there's who no drink, tea. Who drink water. <laughs> who drink water. <laughs> That's great. Well, so what, what do you think the common thread of that? I mean, there's a, there's a lot of, looking at it from the outside, you can say, well, this is over here and this is over here yep. and this is over here. Sure. I mean, I think there's a couple common threads. I think one, I think, um, and, and it kind of relates to what I'm doing today, you know, there's always, I, I've always tried to have some sort of public service as part of my um, I think just it's kind of how I was raised. It's it's where I went to college. It was kind of the values that were instilled in me. Um, so everything from um, the time I spent with AmeriCorps, um, even when I was in Russia, I consulted with a nonprofit um, uh, that focused on children with Down syndrome. Um, so that part of me, that part has sort of always been in me. So there's always been um, probably almost two decades now some level of focus on on the importance of housing for people. Um, uh, again, be it providing housing for kids that have aged out, and no longer kids, but kids that have aged out of foster care um, or trying to keep children with their homes uh, that have been diagnosed with Down syndrome or um, the time I spent with Habitat for Humanity, um, building the ReStore. And then kind of all of those, um, there's also been an underlying focus of kind of my business background. So I'm a firm believer in, in just not, you know, doing good for the sake of good is important, but it has to be effective. So I've been able to kind of take my business experience and take all those to, to kind of the next level and make them successful. So. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Where, did, where did you go to school? Uh, to Loyola in Baltimore. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. So how does being a county commissioner fit into all that? Yeah, I mean, it, in a lot of ways, well, in a lot of ways <laughs> is a very, is a short answer. Um, you know, there's a couple reasons that, that got me into this to begin with that, that sort of set me down this path. Um, the big one was housing. Uh, so I sat on the APSHA board for a while. Um, before that, I sat on the, it was called Housing Frontiers. It was a very informal advisory group to APSHA. Um, so we, you know, we weren't, we weren't appointed. It was more of, um, I sat on there with, with Adam Frisch, you know, our former council member and, and other um, former council members and members of the organization itself. So it was more of like a coffee club is sort of what we called it, but we had the luxury of, of just being able to bounce off ideas and, and uh, come up with some new, you know, potential solutions. Um, and so that, that really got me involved locally. Um, and then when a seat opened up on the APSHA board, I had the opportunity to, to interview for that and be appointed. Um, so that's, that's kind of what's- When was that? That was, I um, uh, can't remember when the term started. Um, when the board was reorganized, there was a new intergovernmental agreement that sort of reshaped the board um, and that effectively dissolve the existing board, and that happened last summer. So I sat on the board through the end of last summer. Um, it was my last involvement. Um, so housing, huge, um, which it's always been part of me. I mean, we have to have some place to live, and um, we don't know the numbers, but it's roughly 40% of the people who vote in Picking County um, 
live in affordable housing. We have about 3,300 units. So it's, it's a big deal in our community. Um, and then I think if you start to step back and look at some other issues, because um, I've owned a small business for the last almost 10 years, um, every year I watch my health insurance go up, you know, as every business owner does. And most people think it's a federal issue. You know, it's, it's what Congress is doing in the right, but there's solutions at the local level. Um, Picking County has the highest, this is not something we should be proud of, we have the highest, uninsur uh, we have the highest insurance premiums in the entire United States, um, which a lot of people don't realize. We have the highest uninsured rate in the state of Colorado. Um, and those two go hand in hand. So we need to be looking more at local solutions to fix that. Um, and the county's been doing that for a while. Um, our elected officials haven't been super in involved in that process. Um, we have something called the Valley Health Alliance. Um, they've been doing a lot of work behind the scenes. I was just excited to see yesterday, they're just getting ready to announce a new rate structure next week. Um, and they th we'll wait and see how it looks, but I, I know they're really excited. I've spoken with their executive director to, to help drive our premiums down. Um, it's gonna be a long battle, so I think, um, so that's kind of number two, you know, so the housing and health insurance. You know, and then you asked about my background, like the county budget is $142 million. It's a lot of money. Um, and right now with coronavirus and how is that impacting, what's that budget gonna look like? You know, they just, they just announced the other day that, I, or, or I heard that the state of Colorado is gonna be down 20% on our uh, budget for next year. That's going to impact all of us. So we really. Oh, need the state is cutting its budget by twenty percent. Yeah, and it's and it's still unclear. Well, and there's a. I just want to make the distinction. There's, the revenues are going to be down twenty percent. So it's a balanced budget. So you can take the next leap, which they would need to be cut. Um, they, I don't think they've gotten that far yet. They do know that they're going to have twenty percent less to spend. So all that's going to trickle down. Um, we're seeing it here locally with our restaurant community has been decimated. Um, so I think it's really important that we have somebody who has small business experience. Um, and some of my businesses that I worked at were a lot, lar a lot larger than small. You know, that, that kind of has that background, um, especially because we're talking about such large amounts of money. Um, and that impacts all of us for everything from you know, the library, to the hospital, to the roads, to, um, to the airport. And there's a lot of employees involved. You know, there's, it, it's tricky the way the county counts, but you know, there's, there's at least more than 300 employees. They're one of the largest employers in the county. So there's a lot of families that are affected by this. So does that, does that help a little bit? Yeah, it does. <laughs> I think it's fascinating. And so your number one issue is housing? Number um, two, health care, or did I flip that? Uh, you know, I, I don't want to put a priority because they're all, they're all yeah. related. Um, you know, if we were having this conversation in February, I would have said housing. Um, we're having the conversation today, and I think we can't have a conversation about anything without talking about COVID. Um, it's, just, it's just the state of the world. It's where we're at. Um, so that right now, you know, if I were to be elected, would be my number one focus. You know, we've got to get, we've got to figure out our testing strategy. Other communities have figured it out. Um, and I just, I think we've been behind the eight ball. Um, you know, I, I saw something even last week, you know, some of the communities in the Western Slope, so in, in, in Vail, for example, you can go get a test right now. Picking County, you still can't. You have to get a prescription, you have to jump through some hoops. Um, and it's affecting everything. It's affecting our, our tourism, it's affecting our economy, it's affecting the ability of our schools to open. So we've got to figure out testing. Um, and the other thing I've been a big proponent of is we have to have really clear and consistent communication with our community. And I think the county did a lot of things right, but I think the county really failed on communicating with the public. How so? Um, well, let me give you an example. There is a doctor in, in Ohio. Um, I believe she's the state. And again, I, I realize I'm comparing little apples and oranges, but she's at the state level. She, I think her name is Dr. Amy Acton. And she is the state's public health director. Um, she was amazing. Daily press conferences. Daily, you know, 
So she would come out every day, give a briefing. Here's where we're at. Here's where our numbers are at. Here's what we need to be doing. Here's how this is affecting us. Here's why this is affecting us. A lot of people to this day, my, some of my friends, you know, they don't understand the importance of wearing masks. They don't understand the impact that the virus could have on our healthcare system um, if, we have an, if we have a big outbreak. And that's our concern. I, I forget the number, but I think we might have five ICU beds. That's five. There's 18,000 people in the county. So if we have a big outbreak, our system will be overwhelmed. And, and the reality is almost everybody who got sick was flown down to Denver. You know, they didn't receive care here. Um, it's a vascular disease, but it affects you, your, your respiratory system. Um, we're at 8,000 feet. Any respiratory effects at 8,000 feet are compounded. So that's why everybody goes down to Denver. Um, so, you know, I mentioned the Ohio uh, public health director who did an amazing job communicating all those things. We didn't do that here. Um, you know, we had an incident management team. Um, I was very engaged, um, you know, I paid attention, I watched all the briefings, you know, I read everything I get my hands on. Um, and I kept asking, it was unclear who was in charge of our incident management team. Nobody knew. One day it might be this person, one night it might be the next person. One day we woke up and opened up the paper and the incident management team had been disbanded. Um, you know, uh, again, I realized that this is new and I think we have to recognize that. Um, I'm not saying that everybody should have all the answers, but we didn't have the communication strategy in place. And, and as a result, our, it's hurt our businesses. You know, our, our restaurants, one day they're told they can open, one day they're told they have to close, one day they're told they can have 20 people and the next day they're told they can have five people. They, they don't, and you can't operate that way. Um, so we've got to fix that. Um, and we have to fix the testing. Those two together, hand in hand. Yeah. So, um, does that help? <laughs> it does help. Um, you know, and, is, and what, what got you to become excited about running to be a county commissioner? How did, how did, how did you pick that? Sure. As being the way you want to do your public service. I mean, um, again, I, th I, I, I think I circle a lot of this back to housing. Um, when I lived in the city, I had, um, when I lived in the city limits, um, I'd thought about running for uh, city council. Um, and to be honest, if I still lived in the city, I, I, I probably would. Um, but I don't, so I. I can't. Um, so that sort of made me start to think about what's the next level. So because I live in Snowmass, you know, Snowmass Village is incorporated, but we are part of the county. And, and just because you live in the city doesn't mean you can't run for the commissioner. Right. Um, so, so for me, I, I started to see like, that, that there was maybe uh, an opportunity to have an even greater impact uh, with a lot of different issues. You know? So housing is just one part of it. Um, and it's, it's so, so important. Um, a lot of it came from the, I won't bore you with all the, the wonky details, but a lot of it came from um, about 18 months ago, the county and the city, they have what's called an inter intergovernmental agreement, and that governs APSHA, which is our affordable housing program. And, And I really want to harp on it for a second because APSHA stands for the Aspen Picking County Housing Authority. And so many folks equate the city of Aspen with APSHA. And they forget that the county is a 50-50 partner. Um, so there's this governance agreement that kind of says this is how you need to operate. And there's been a conflict of interest for a long, long time. Um, and some people don't like that term, but, but it really is a conflict because how the so? um, the executive director of APSHA um, has a lot of masters, and 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 it's and it's a, and until we address that problem, they can't govern effectively. So the way it works right now is there's a board. Let me back up. The way it worked was there was a board, and those were citizen volunteers like myself, and they were appointed by either the city or the county. They had equal seats. Well, they all got together and. And we've known that this is a, a struggle for years. So APSHA has always sort of been hamstrung because they're appointed citizens, not elected. And 
the county contributes half the budget, the city contributes half the budget to the operating portion, and APSHA doesn't build. A lot of people don't understand that. APSHA does not build. Um, they've been partners with organizations that do create new housing, but they don't have the budget to build. Most of the new buildings coming out of the city. Um, so as a result of the, of the structure, of the old structure, the board itself really couldn't create new policies because the policy would then have to go to the county, the BOCC would have to vote on it, have to go to the city, the council would vote on it, they'd come back together. It's kind of like Congress, then they'd have to reconcile it, go back. So one policy change could take eight months, it, it, if it could even get approved. So we all agreed that that was a problem. The elected officials at the time thought the best course of action was to take elected officials from each body, from the county and the city, and to put them on the APSHA board, kind of like the RAFTA board operates or um, like EOTC, um, like some of the other joint boards we have. So the thought was they'd have a seat at the table, they could sort of speak for their respective bodies, and they could help create policy and they could speed that process up. So in theory, it's a great idea. The problem was, and we knew this before it was approved, it had been done before. That's the way it was 20 years ago, and it didn't work. Um, when a conflicting thing would come before the board, the elected might have to recuse themselves, um, and it didn't fix the problem. So what myself and a lot of the other members called for was kind of a, let's take a step back, let's use this opportunity, and we really need the organization to be independent. The board should be elected by the citizens, just like the hospital board is, just like the fire board, it's, it's not a unique concept. They're accountable to the voters. And this is really drives at your question, is that the executive director really needs to report to the board of directors. And right now they don't. Even though it's APSHA and it's Aspen Picking County, the executive director, their paycheck, their pay stub, their performance review, they report directly to the Aspen city manager. Um, about, uh, about a month ago, um, for the second time in a row, the, the executive director was compelled to resign by the Aspen city manager because they didn't see eye to eye. It doesn't meet the needs of the citizens of Picking County. Um, he could not do his job effectively um, and it has caused a lot of issues. Um, and so I was pretty vocal at the time that I didn't think the structure would work. And, um, and unfortunately it didn't and, and it was actually even worse than it didn't work. They, they're now rudderless. There is no director of APSHA. So I stand by my call for an independent organization that we've got to fix this structural issue. Once we fix the stru structural issue, then we can start to set these strategic goals we've talked about, we have solutions for. Um, you know, APSHA is an amazing program. I wouldn't be here without it. I mean, I, you know, like I said, I lived over the daily in an APSHA rental. I lived in Burlingame in an APSHA ownership unit, and that allowed me to get to where I am today. We've got to fix those things. Um, and, and it all starts with the structure. So long answer, that's the main reason I wanted to run, was to have a seat at the table and to be able to help fix that. And when I had a conversation with somebody the other day, I said, you know, my goal, you know, under the current structure, there's elected officials on the APSHA board. I don't want to be that elected official on the APSHA board. I want to fix the structure and I want to see, you know, perhaps you as a representative. You know, I want to see my neighbor as a representative. Maybe not you, um, <laughs> uh, since you live in Picking County. But, you know, I want to see a representative who's elected by the people on that board. And I want to see them engaged and I want to see them making the decisions. It's not a place for our elected officials to be. And, and there's a lot of talk about how do we address the funding, and, and there's a path forward to that. Um, there's a clear path forward. Um, but we've got to fix it. You know, the organization's uh, about 40 years old. We're one of the first affordable housing gr groups in the country. Um, and um, it's done a lot of good, but a lot of our inventory is getting older, and we have to address a lot of those issues. Uh, our population's getting bigger. We need to figure out how to address that. Um, 
and all this comes together. You know, it affects it affects our infrastructure, it affects so many people. I met somebody the other day. You know, they commute here every day from Rifle. You know, we need to be thinking long term. Do we need to be looking at a valley wide approach to affordable housing? You know, how do we how do we look at that and and we need, you know, Picking County is a special place. I love it. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm running for Picking County Commissioner. I mean, it's, I think it's the greatest place in the country. But we can't be myopic. You know, we've got to, we don't, we like to think we live in a bubble, but we don't. You know, we are part of this greater community, and we've got to figure that solution out. So that's my pitch. You know, I'm curious because the, uh, the, the things that you're mentioning are complex, and there, yeah. and, and there is a lot of history. There's layers in there. Um, and one of the things that it raised for me is that if you create an elected uh, APSHA board, mm -hmm. that is a political process. Mm -hmm. and, and the APSHA board, at least historically, has been somewhat insulated from that. Uh, to be able to make what are, as you mentioned, they don't build housing. That's oftentimes the very political part of it. Where are we going to put this housing? I don't want it next to me. Yep. Um, and, and the elected officials have been charged with that in a sense because it is, that is a political process. But the idea of managing a housing complex, for lack of a better word, um, is oftentimes thought to be to benefit from not having a political component. Mm -hmm. So have you thought about how you reconcile that? That I have, you know, I, I would turn the question around and I would say, sort of, and I'll give you my opinion, but, you know, um, which is, I don't think that our school district board is political. And I know there's some folks who might disagree because there's been some challenges lately between, you know, between staff and administration. But historically, they've always been elected by the public. But they're not political, you know. Nobody's, and, and, and if you want to take it to the next step, I would even use the word partisan. You know, it's not, there's not a Democrat or a Republican bent to it. It's just, they're there, they're, they are elected, but, but it's not political. The fire board's the same way. The hospital board's the same way. Um, so we have a long history of that, of managing a process that way in our community. Um, and there's no reason that our housing board shouldn't be the same. Um, and I, you know, and I, I don't see, um, you know, if that's the path that we ultimately go down, you know, I don't see that as a partisan process. Um, you know, if you want to use the, the larger global, like political, everything's political. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's all, it, the importance there is, comes back to the governance and that they can set strategic goals, they can fulfill them. Um, and here's what I mean by the conflict. So I think if we step back and talk about that conflict a mm -hmm. second, is that the city has the RET. I'm going to get into the weeds for a second, the real estate transfer tax. So every time somebody buys a new home, they have to write a check for 1.5% of their purchase price. 1% of that number goes into a pot of money called the 150 fund. It's for the city of Aspen, only the city of Aspen. The county doesn't have that fund. They have some impact fees. There's a tiny percentage of sales tax, but it's, it's minuscule. City has a big pot of money. The county doesn't have any. So all the money from the county has to come from their general fund, from just our mill levy that we pay on our property taxes. A lot of folks don't realize this. APSHA, their budget, about 70% of the budget, and I, don't hold me the number because this year was a big change because they're rolling out a, a new IT system. Um, the balance of the budget that's not supported through um, application fees when somebody wants to apply or when somebody sells a, a home within the system, all that money comes split evenly between the city of Aspen and the county. So when the city of Aspen has a big pot of money and the county doesn't have any, and the executive director and the staff are all technically city employees and report to the city manager, it creates a very difficult dynamic because the interest of the county might actually be overrun just from a financial perspective by the interest of the city who has the bigger pocketbook. Um, I think if you talk to, 
Tom Smith, who's the, who's the longtime sort of um, uh, lawyer for, uh, I don't know if you know Tom, but um, I know Tom. yeah. Uh, so you know, and, and Tom is you know a, a great guy and has been involved with Absha. I think probably since it started. I know at least since the early in 80s. one form or another. He was at one time the county attorney. So so he might have even helped form it. I don't hold me to that. But I know Tom has been in, kind of helped advising Absha since the eighties. If you talk to Tom about the history, so I mentioned before, like we just changed the governance agreement to go back twenty years. Um, 20 years ago, all those folks I just mentioned were actually county employees. Because at the time, the county was the elephant in the room. The county had more money and the city was smaller. So things have flip-flopped. And, and they might flip, I don't think we'll have, I don't think the dynamics will ever go also, back. at that time, there were seven joint departments. <laughs> you know, it almost, the, the goal was to, at one point, combine the two governments. That never worked. But the goal was to make it seamless between the city and the county. Right. Um, we failed in that goal, <laughs> at least at least when it comes to housing. Um, so this isn't a new issue. There's a lot of layers. There's a lot of history. Uh, you know, I think. You know, you asked about me. You know, we're in an interesting position where we have the least amount of elected officials right now who have ever. Who, who are, are serving or, and who are running, who have ever been, and by been, I mean lived in affordable housing. I have. I've lived in it for twice. Most of my, you know, 70% of the time I've lived here was in affordable housing. And I think if you look at historically, like, you know, and you go back and you look at Mick, you know, and you look at, you know, our past commissioners and our past city council members, there was a time when the majority of them lived in affordable housing. And now, it's, they're tiny, so they don't have that. They don't have that personal, um, you know. And, and it's nothing against them. They just they don't. They haven't experienced themselves. And when you've experienced it yourself, you can relate to the almost half of our population who experiences it every day. So for me, that's really important. So. Cool. Yeah. Um, Let me give you a chance to change gears a little yeah, bit. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you like to do? Are you going to keep going with your photography business when you're a commissioner? How does that work? Sure. I sure hope so. I mean, um, you know, there's a lot of work to do as a commissioner. Um, you know, technically it is not a full-time job. I think, like anything, it's, it's what you make of it and how much you can engage. Um, but I have clients that I've worked with here for a long time. Um, and, and, and I, you know, and even if I'm not able to do it to the extent you know, I still love picking up the camera. Um, you know, last week I had an opportunity to go up to Marine Bells. Like, I love to get up early in the morning, you know, take, you know, just to take pretty pictures. It's just, and we live in a great place to do that. So, yes. Yeah. yeah. And you could build up stock photos with that, too, as, as part of. Yeah, you can. Yeah. 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 And there's always local magazines, you know, that are, that are, that need some new Im imagery. And, you know, so there's always an opportunity. So, I, 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 you know, I hope I win and I hope I, you know, I would definitely keep. You hope you win and you hope you have that time pressure to balance between exactly. Exactly. being county commissioner and keeping going with the business. Because so many folks, have, they become a county commissioner and then it is their full-time job. Yep. Yeah. And, and, and I think, you know, again, I, I think I'm really good at time management. I think if you look at, you know, um, you know, even Rob Bittner, you know, one of our former BOCC members, you know, he managed... Kept his very, you know, you know, big restaurant operation. So, um, you know, Rob could do it, and my operation's a, a, a fraction of, of what his is. So, and and what do you do when you're not working for fun? Or sure, um, I, I do a lot of mountain biking. I'm a huge bicyclist. Um, I used to do a lot more. Um, um, little fun fact: I uh, after I graduated college, I rode across the U.S. on my bicycle. Um, and I've ridden across Europe, um, some kind of big rides. Um, around here, I do a ton of mountain biking in Somes. Um, kind of like everybody else, you know, I, I can't keep up with all the our Olympic athletes, but um, it's a very difficult place to be competitive. I, I'm just happy to go outside. <laughs> um, in the winter time, I do a, a ski, um, and um, uh, and I do a lot of skinning. So. Um, you know, snow mass is great because I can go out my door, I can skin up to the top and be back home and be back at my desk by, you know, 8 o'clock and I've already, you know, skinned for an hour and a half, two hours. So. so do you have a family or? 
Uh, nope, I have a longtime partner. Um, her name's Emily. Um, she actually owns a, uh, or not owns, she was just awarded a studio next door at the Red Brick. Yeah. So she's over there painting. And, um, but we've worked together for a long time um, as photography partners uh, in our business. Um, no kids, and uh, yeah, so pretty quiet. Dog? No dog. I used to have a cat, um, and um, hopefully one day I'll, I'll get a new one. Yeah. Pro pro hopefully sooner than later. So. Well, you can reward yourself if you win the election. Yeah. Get I'll, a pet. I, even if I don't win, I'll, I'm, it's. I had I had a favorite, like the best. You know, all everybody's animal is the best. So, but um, the most amazing cat um, that I brought back from Russia that I found on the street, and um, it's, you know. It takes a long time after they pass away to, to get back to the point where you're like, okay, now I can have a new one. <laughs> right, when you're emotionally ready to yeah. let another critter into your life. Yes, yeah. That's great. Well, I, 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 I'm fascinated, again, by the, the story, the eclectic nature of it. So it brings me back to um, how do you think all of those experiences apply to how you would approach being a county commissioner? Yeah, um, you know, I, like, do you like meetings? Um, I like meetings that are effective, um, you know, so I think, I think if you look at my, my history, you know, I've sat in a lot of meetings, um, and, um, you know, locally with APSHA and, and, and just in my career, lots of meetings, um, but I don't know anybody who likes meetings, so, um, I think there's kind of two pieces to that. I think one is is because I do have a varied background, but like you said, there, there is a consistent thread through all of them. You know, there is a consistent public service thread. There is a consistent, you know, financial um, kind of leadership thread through all of those. Um, so I have that. And each one, even though they've been a little different, they all take the same skill set. Um, and I've met and worked with, which is the key, so many different people in my, you know, in my career. Um, and it's really important to understand there's five county commissioners. You know, I'm just running for one seat. So there's four, and, and in fact, I, I spoke with um, one of the commissioners yesterday and, and, and I was sharing with them is that, you know, it's really important to me that, that regardless of whom is elected, whomever is elected, that we all do have to work together. Because if each, you know, if anybody works in a silo, we're not gonna get anything done. Um, which doesn't mean that we can't have different ideas on how to fix, you know, on how to address a certain problem or have, um, and that discourse is good. You know, I, I think if every single vote is 5-0, I actually think that something, there's something wrong. I think that, that we failed somewhere, that either we didn't have enough difference of opinion or we didn't have enough level of discussion and, and sometimes I hear you know you know that that there's a level of you know proudness if that's not the correct word but you know you know that that they vote as a block um, and, and in some cases I think that's good um, but in other cases I, I you know I think that we have failed the citizens a little bit by by not looking at different solutions and engaging but my point is regardless I'm just one person, and there are four other people at the table, and we all have to work together. And I wouldn't be where I am today with my business and my career if I hadn't done that time and time again, um, because, you know, we're humans. We have right. to, you know, we have to get along. We have to engage. We have to do it in a respectful manner. Um, we have to listen, um, and we have to compromise, and that's really important. So. It really is. It, I, th I think so many times people do run individually, but then to be successful, you have to be part of a group that yeah. gets at least two other vo votes, if not more, to yeah. be able to move forward. Yeah, no. And, you know, and all the things we've talked about, the things that I would love to and I want to accomplish. But again, I need at least two other people to help yeah. me accomplish those, ideally four. Um, because, and, and I say four, and it's really 18,000 because it's, you know, it's every citizen in Pickens County. All these issues affect everybody, and we all need to come together to, to, to accomplish them. And how, how has it been, what has it been like campaigning? Uh, it, 
It's been fun. I mean, it's been, um, you know, there's some parts of the county I've, I've lived here almost, um, you know, this is you know, just last month was my 10th uh, 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 time to be able to watch the Snowmass Balloon Festival. And, um, uh, you know, I've been able to see parts of the county that I haven't seen before. And mm -hmm. I think it's really neat. Um, so um, I've, I've met, you know, my days at the paper and, and just by nature of my profession, I've been able to meet a lot of folks over the years. But I've a lot of, met a lot of new people that, you know, and, and heard their stories that I wouldn't have had the opportunity to do. So. Well, and, and District 4 is so interesting because it, it includes Snowmass Village and then some very rural parts of the county and up yep. the Crystal and yep. Capitol well, Creek. Uh, and not necessarily Crystal. Crystal, more, sorry, Capitol Creek. Five. Yeah, yeah, Capitol Creek. You know, I think one thing that I will plug, and I'll plug this for every BOCC candidate that's really important um, for anybody who's watching, is we represent a district. You know, Pickens County has a home rule charter. Um, but really all that means is in order to run in that district, you have to live in the district. This is an at-large election. Every Pickens County voter can vote for every representative in every district. And our, and our job, and my job as I look at it, is to represent every citizen of Pickens County. So as I make my, my way around, I'm literally looking at every aspect of the county. I'm not just looking at District 4, and that's so important. So. It is. It's, it's, it's another one of those kind of dynamic tension things you talk about that, or you, that you've alluded to of, of you, you are elected at, at large, but at the same time there is a voice to a particular portion of the county Yep. so that the population center just doesn't take over everything. In theory. Yeah, in theory. <laughs> That's true. So let's let's imagine you've been um, on the county commissioner for four years. Congratulations on your election. Uh, we'll talk about whether you want to run again. But what would you be most proud of having accomplished in that period of time? You know, or what would you do? You have a, your list. Do you have a I do. List? I do. Yeah, and it's it's an easy list, and it's all the things we talked about. So if if, if we fast forward to four years, and I look back, and I could say. Uh, APSHA is now an independent organization with an independently elected board of directors, and they have set, in year one, clear strategic goals, and they've already managed to accomplish half of those, you know, relative to capital reserves and, and sort of looking at some of these other big issues. If, if we've helped drive down our health insurance premiums for everybody in the county, if we've lowered that uninsured rate, those two are, are, are massive. You know, we haven't even talked about growth, but, um, you know, uh, taking a look at our building code, um, we need to be thinking about how does that impact climate change. Um, I am not a, I am not for any of um, some of the latest proposals that have been pretty draconian, um, but I think that there are things that we can be doing. Uh, the airport is coming down the pike. Whether or not we want it, um, it's coming down. We need to address that. So I'd be really proud if I could look back and say we made you know a really smart, educated decision based on all the facts. Um, and finally. You know, hopefully in 18 months, I, I hope it's not that long, there's a vaccine and life is slowly returned to normal. But I'd love to be able to look back and say, you know, the first part of my term in office, you know, we did get our economy back up and running through testing, through, um, through a good communication strategy. And we addressed all the impacts of COVID, uh, you know, in a smart and, you know, in a smart manner. And, and we did it in a way that you know, that made it successful for the future. So, All right, so. great. We have less than a minute left. If, I, if you have anything you want to say that I've not managed to <laughs> give you the opportunity to do, you have a few seconds to say something. Sure. You know, I just, I, you know, I think we probably covered it all. I, I just feel so lucky to live here. I think that Picking County is, is one of the greatest places on earth. And, uh, and you know, and I would love to have, you know, at, at some point, uh, the opportunity, you know, f for our citizens, you know, to serve them in, in some capacity. That's so, great. Great. Thank Chris, you. Chris, it was great. Really nice meeting you. Great. You too. Thank you so much. All right. And that concludes another episode of ProBline. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed it and found it informative. Um, and again, if you can help us put this programming and other programming on the air, we'd appreciate a donation to grassrootstv.org. Thank you.